Minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who you want to hear from at this point in time. Not because of, I mean, how long he spent in the office, I mean, what he's doing, but because of a present challenge ministry that concern is ministry is ministry i beg to say and how we can really end this at the moment joining us this morning is the coordinating minister for health and social welfare professor muhammad ali party thank you indeed for joining us on the program honorable minister thank you for having me all right, it's so amazing to have you at this point in time because generally speaking one would imagine how it's been for you serving in this capacity based on peculiar what we have to deal with in a healthcare sector in the country? Well, last year, at the beginning of this administration, we articulated an agenda, the Health Sector Renewal Investment Initiative, which had four fillers. One, to improve governance of the sector so that the federal government, states, local governments, development partners, private sector, civil society work together to respond to the needs of Nigerian citizens to be more transparent, more accountable, and to work together hand in hand to mobilize the resources and prioritize health. Secondly, to improve the population health outcomes, either through the primary health care system or the hospitals that are under the federal government as well as those under the state governments, so that the burden of disease, maternal death, child death, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, the non-communicable diseases that are arising, like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, that we can begin to respond to them and be able to tell that we're responding. And thirdly, to unlock the healthcare value chain, to create economic value by working in health, producing things that we will consume, as well as the fourth pillar, to enhance health security, dealing with outbreaks. As part of that initiative, which was unveiled by Mr. President Bola Ahmed Chinubu, we agreed that we will take quarter, we'll take uh, performance dialogue with the states and others on a quarterly basis and on an annual basis we'll have an annual review the first one will take place this week which will lead to the state of health report the first ever state of nigeria's health report that will be uh, launched basically telling us where we are uh, what we're doing well and where we need to do more so that we are holding ourselves accountable for performance and on an annual basis to do that and to do that collaboratively between federal government states development partners civil and everyone else in addition we have the benefit of a 2023 demographic and household health survey which will be um, reviewed as well which tells us the baseline we've seen the evolution of Nigeria's health over the last several years until 2023, that's the baseline. And periodically, this will be repeated so that we see with facts that we're making progress. In addition, we had a People's Voices Survey in 2023, which asked 2,500 Nigerians their perception of the health sector in a way that is rigorous. We sample rather than individual narratives, but as a, as using a survey instrument, to be able to tell what is the perception of Nigerians. Now this year, we have repeated that, so we can tell over the last 12 months what has changed. Now the key messages are that, one, there have been good news in terms of improvement of population health in Nigeria, including reduction in diarrheal diseases, lower respiratory infections, some reduction in HIV, marginal reduction of malaria, slight improvement in immunization. And we've seen increase in utilization of health services over the last 12 months, despite the prevailing circumstances, hypertension, diabetes. People have been checking their blood pressure, checking their diabetes and getting treated. The not so good news is that the cost of care is also gone up. So we need to do more on expanding right. insurance, even though we've added 2.4 million Nigerians to be covered, but that's not enough. Much of those... Uh, uh, in, much of that increase is from the public sector health insurance, whether federal government through NHA or the state. Private health insurance has been flat, right. so we need to do more in that regard. Okay. So those are the kinds of things that are emerging. Very, but very fundamentally, yeah. may I just add one more point, okay. that the confidence of Nigerians, the perception, more than half of Nigerians 
are confident in terms of the quality of care that is being received. And they have confidence that government is able to respond to health emergencies. But the not so good news, of course, is the issue of the cost of care, which is uh, still high. I mean, you are able to chronicle all of this in just one sentence, which makes uh, our job a lot easier for us today. But we're going to be putting across your questions that Nigerians are asking. I'd like for you to uh, let Nigerians know with regards to what you inherited under the administration of President Bolatinu in our health infrastructure, especially pri primary health care in the country. Uh, a lot of people are saying, you go to most of the private health care centers, you can't even see them. See them means that the, the, the structure, the infrastructure, talk less the people, and things that you really expect to find in a private health care center. We'd like for you to shed more light on this. We assessed thousands of primary health care centers in the country uh, when we came in. And we realized that less than a third of them are fully functional. There are others, they are somewhat functional, but not functional. And we decided to invest uh, in terms of revitalizing those primary health care centers, make them fully functional, have uh, the infrastructure, uh, water, uh, to some extent power. But that's a gradual process because it's a deficit that has accrued over years, if not decades. We have not been investing in a determined way, on a consistent manner, over time uh, to provide the health infrastructure that Nigerians need. And primary health care is in the realm of the states and local governments. Federal government is only supporting. We also embarked on training because a lot of the health workers that were even present had not had much retraining. So we embarked on retraining of 120,000 of them, and we have now retrained 40,000 on our way to that 120,000. That's at the primary health care level. We focus extensively on the higher level as well, on the teaching hospitals. And as you recall, earlier this year, the president approved the expansion of cancer infrastructure, six of them, through uh, the Federal Ministry of Health, working with the NSA. And two of those are already in advanced stages, will be completed by May 2025 and will be open. But the four will follow. There are also 10 major health infrastructural projects eight diagnostic centers and two oncology centers through NHIS um, MedServe, which will provide higher quality services, specialist services, diagnostic services, oncological services, while expecting that the states and local government will also join us to invest in revitalizing primary health care. We've also channeled the basic health care provision fund through the NPHCDA, the Primary Health Care Development Agency, at the federal level to provide resources uh, to the all the states. We've done three rounds of disbursements and we've tracked to ensure the resources go to the front end while expanding, uh, expanding affordability through the NHIA of the Vulnerable Goods Fund, which basically provide uh, uh, payments for services for the poorest and most vulnerable population. Thank you very much indeed, Honorable Minister. I, I, now that you have talked about affordability and uh, you know, taking care of the vulnerable, let's talk about the cost of drugs, for example. In recent times, it's been really a big issue. You know, people now even beg and advise, admonish themselves that please don't ever try not to fall sick because if you do, the drugs are expensive. Some hospitals have uh, categories of pharmacies, they have what they call the fee-paying pharmacy, they have the subsidized pharmacy. Is there some kind of deliberate program to ensure that uh, people who seek health care are able to get drugs at some, you know, some uh, uh, price, that some kind of you know, uh, subsidy or something? Uh, is there any direct intention or work towards that? E yes. Yes. I think, let me just explain that for the health sector, our clients, our primary customers are all the Nigerian population, of which the majority are healthy, and we want them to stay healthy, to prevent them from progressing. That's why last week, in fact, we had the National Health Promotion Day, the first of its kind, so that uh, folks are able to check their blood pressure, check their glucose, check their cholesterol, know your numbers campaign, which is being conducted in all the 36 states, by the commissioners of health, by their state governments, with support and collaboration of the federal government. 
so that we can prevent diseases before you even require to be treated. Now, for those who are unfortunately sick, we have to take care of them. And there are a few things that we have done. First, to locally manufacture some of the basic commodities that we need. And for the first time, we have an executive order signed by the president to lower the cost of pharmaceuticals, to lower the uh, tariff on raw materials, manufacturing equipment, so that those who are producing those medications here can produce them at lower cost. Hopefully that will be translated into lower prices uh, for people. On the other side, to have demand side interventions to pull procure lower cost medications and distribute them for the poorest and most vulnerable. We have that in our budget and we have started to acquire those medications, but to target them to the poorest and most vulnerable. In addition, there's a medical relief program which the president approved, which also provides some relief uh, to Nigerians. It's not easy because the inflation, devaluation, and the rising cost of several other items, health is not excluded. But from the health sector side, we've been working hard to see that we respond to the needs. In addition, the expansion of health insurance is a key strategy so that folks can be able to afford the treatment when they need, whether drugs or, let's say, cesarean section. So NHIA has been expanding uh, affordability of complicated uh, surgeries for pregnant women, for instance, cesarean section, or for women who have obstetric fistula. Now it's been offered free. And I've seen women whose lives have been changed because they're able to afford this surgery to repair obstetric fistula in the four fistula centers that we have, and they don't pay anything. Uh, that is all part of the effort that we're making to ensure that we respond to the needs of Nigerian population, particularly the poorest and the most vulnerable, our women, our children, and those who are poor in our population. All right. Honorable Minister, I'm, I'm talking directly from my heart. That's how I want to speak this morning on the fact that many Nigerians are wondering how come we're not as a nation able to produce the medicines that we need. I'm sure you can't forget in a hurry what happened during COVID-19. We had to wait on countries uh, to get uh, our vaccines done. What is holding us? I think we became complacent uh, over the last several decades as a population, whereby we became really open to everyone coming in, uh, producing, and we just buy. Uh, we were importing from everywhere. Countries similar to us were really manufacturing products and bringing to our country. 99% of devices. That's why in this administration, Mr. President, in October last year, uh, flagged off an initiative called the Presidential Initiative to unlock the healthcare value chain, to look at it across the spectrum, from policy and uh, to um, regulatory improvements, uh, to access to capital, to demand side, to pull procurement, to pull the demand from our country and support the local industry. Policy-wise, the executive order that he signed, which has now been gazetted was to signal that, but also to enable the local manufacturing to progress. And we have seen a very positive response from our local industry, but also from others who are willing to come now and invest and produce in our country. As a large country, it's a matter of survival for us to have those capabilities and to anchor it on strong science uh, so that we have research capacity, clinical trial capacity, but also to encourage our own industry. It's challenging. I know that there are some, like say, syringe uh, manufacturers who have been struggling because they produce at a relatively higher cost and then others are dumping uh, syringes from other places, importing, bypassing uh, borders through customs and be able to uh, um, come at a lower cost, which makes them less competitive. So we're trying to address that. And the executive order has now brought health ministry, trade and investment uh, ministry, customs, regulators to work together so that we make it easier to regulate uh, the quality of what is out in the market. And then counterfeit and substandard products. Because if we don't have a strong regulator, counterfeit and substandard products can undercut even our local manufacturers. And that's why we're working with the health regulators, trying to improve them. NAVDAC, Pharmaceutical Council of Nigeria. It's not an easy task. Uh, given that we've had decades where we are largely importing things. And when we 
had the devaluation and the, uh, uh, the the inflation and the state of the world. We basically are now playing catch up, but we're determined to do that. And uh, Mr. President has backed it, has given it direction, and we're forging ahead. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Honorable Minister. Uh, let's talk a bit more about primary health care. Uh, you've committed to working with the sub-nationals, the state governments and local governments to increase the number of uh, primary health centers in the country from 8,000 to 17,000 in three years. Uh, how can you ensure uh, accountability in this um, project and are you getting the kind of support and cooperation you need from states and local governments? For the first time, we saw all the 36 state governments uh, and the FCT sign on to a compact with the federal government witnessed by His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, that will work together and that the states will contribute in the revitalization of the primary health care centers. We've raised resources uh, through a program called IMPACT that is available to majority of the states and the Bill of Continuities have been developed, the procurement processes are underway and the states are responsible for that and we will be tracking that and holding them accountable. The compact also has uh, provision for, pro for performance dialogue that on a quarterly basis we look at where we are. And this week, the joint annual review will allow us to take a stock. What have we done so far collectively? What have we learned? Where are we making progress? We now have a scorecard state by state in terms of their population health outcomes and trends, which will continue to track and that will be publicly available and as part of the state health board this will be shared as well so that there are numbers uh, there are also uh, visibility that we can learn not to judge anyone but to really uh, assess what is working well what is working less well and what do we learn from that so that others can improve and those who are doing well will know that they are on the right track so we're doing that collectively and it is something that is long overdue uh, the state right. of health report will present that to Nigerians. All right, thank you, Honorable Minister. Let's talk about the fact that when you travel the world, especially on medical tourism, you're likely, you're most likely, about 40, 50 percent likely, to be meeting with a Nigerian doctor who must have left the country. I'd like for you to talk on the brain drain uh, in the healthcare sector in the country, the impact that you can easily feel, even yourself as Honorable Minister as well as Nigerians, and what your ministry uh, is doing to see that it checks that. There's no surprise. One out of four black person in the world is most likely a Nigerian. And so, and we are also blessed that we have well-trained professionals, uh, university system education, at least several years ago, until recently, have been producing well-trained professionals that are serving here at home, and some travel abroad to advance themselves and to serve in other places. The issue of ter uh, medical tourism is a phenomenon that is not limited to Nigeria. It's a global phenomenon. What we're trying to do is to enable those who are outside if they wish, come back and find it easier to serve in Nigeria. And we're seeing positive response. There are some that have said world-class institutions in Lagos and a few other places that are coming back. Some are coming periodically. In fact, this month, a group from the UK is coming to National Hospital to kick off an effort to serve in our country. So, in fact, the brain drain can be a brain gain. But at the same time, we have to appreciate the majority who stay at home who are working under difficult circumstances, but for one reason or the other decide to stay home. And we also appreciate them. And we're trying to make the working environment uh, good for them to train them. Now, we have a national health workforce migration policy, which was approved again by His Excellency Mr. President uh, in Council, which basically uh, provides incentives for the distribution of the health workforce. We have a, a distribution issue. Uh, a large number of our providers, the senior providers, are in Lagos and Abuja. Many of the rural areas, some of the states, uh, have very few uh, qualified professionals that are working there. So there's the internal distribution. There's not only the quantity, but also the, the issue of distribution. So how do we incentivize health providers to stay in rural areas? How do we take into account work-life balance? There are challenges, particularly for young doctors, 
that uh, work long hours. So how do we begin to improve that? Not only in the public sector, but to encourage the private sector, which is not under direct control of government. How do we enable them to have the capacity to provide the quality services at home, to be trained, uh, to be retrained? Like I mentioned, the 40,000 frontline health workers that are not the ones that will leave the country, but they are there in the communities. Wow. How do we ensure ethical recruitment so that those countries that are recruiting also help us expand the training of the healthcare workers? Mm -hmm. We have doubled the quotas of the medical schools, pharmacy schools, nursing schools, but we are now working to ensure that the quality doesn't deteriorate because we are expanding them. How do we right. govern better? How do we use data and mm -hmm. research to guide the implementation of these policies? So in some, yes, we are blessed with health workers. Some live and some stay. We're working to ensure that we produce more so that if, the, if some leave, at least some will stay. And okay. those who have gone can be able to come back and serve. And right. that Nigerians will begin to feel confident in receiving the care they need in Nigeria All itself. Right. All right, Honorable Minister, what about uh, the allegations that healthcare workers in the country are poorly remunerated? And in fact, that's the main reason why they will want to go abroad and leave uh, the people that even they care for in the hospitals behind. I think you use the word allegation, and I hope that is uh, what it is. Because everyone who gets into the health profession, generally they are a self-selected group. They have intrinsic motivation to serve others. When you are working primarily for money, there are many other professions because these are brilliant. Uh, they tend to be the best in their class. They would go, they can go into anything. They can go to other sectors where they can make tons of money. They go in because they have intrinsic motivation to serve. Despite that, we know that the prevailing economic situation is challenging, not only for health workers but for many others. But there are concerted efforts to improve the um, co compensation, but also there are other ways that you can make their lives easier. When I said we are revitalizing primary health care, for instance, accommodation, where primary health care centers are, uh, retraining, tooling them, giving them the equipment that they need to be able to serve. No matter how much compensation you receive, if you don't have the linear accelerators to deploy the skills, you will still leave. So there are many reasons why people may decide to leave, not just compensation. So if we narrow it just about money, I think we're not doing a great service to the health workers who are serving because they believe and they want to serve others, they want to take care of others. Uh, and I've seen many health workers in very difficult circumstances uh, committing to actually stay and serve. I saw a very well-trained anesthesiologist at Lagos University Teaching Hospital who I asked, why are you not Japanese? He said, look, this is my country, and I want to stay here and contribute to my country. So there are many, many of them. It's not just about the issue of compensation. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's interesting to know that um, uh, those of you in government also know that there is a JAPA syndrome, uh, where quite a number of very skilled, highly skilled Nigerians you know, look elsewhere you know, for better deals. Uh, but like you said, I like the fact that you, you're optimistic. You know, that at some point, they probably come back and then also add value to what we're doing here. Let me take you again to the, you, you spoke briefly about the NHIS and as, um, on how it works. I, I have some personal experience, and I've heard people share their experience about the NHIS, uh, that scheme that is supposed to you know, provide some succor so that people don't have to, uh, they call it out of pocket, you know, uh, when you have to seek medical care. Uh, one, there are two questions in one, really. Uh, you, you find out that um, it, it looks like there's a lot of corruption going on in that scheme. Uh, people, you know, approach medical facilities and they tell them your, your insurance can only cover A, B, or they, you know, they give you attention and then they give you two bills, that this one is from your insurance and then you have to go and pay this. In most times, I had an experience. I was going to pay, you know, about 90% of the bill, I mean, in the name of whatever it is, I've, my insurance only covers 10% of that particular, you know, uh, procedure that I had to go through. And the question would then be, what's the whole essence if I have to look for 90% at any, t any time I need to approach a medical facility? What's the whole essence of my of deductions from my salaries on a monthly basis and, you know, being a, and being a part of the scheme? What's the whole essence? That's one. The second question that is also tied to that is that uh, there are challenges about the attitude and the, 
uh, what you get in the average Nigerian public sector. Doctors argue that uh, you know, they are stressed, they are overwhelmed, that's why they cannot. You can't ask your doctor, for example, why are you giving me these drugs? What drugs is it? Just give you, just give you prescriptions and just throw it at you. You just walk out and go get a pharmacy to you know, administer, I mean, give you the drugs. Uh, we're told that we are ordinarily supposed to ask questions about what are these drugs for, Honorable Minister. So I mentioned the four pillars of the health sector investment initiative. One fundamentally is governance, which is key. It's not just a technical issue, and that's what we're trying to improve. Stronger institution, appropriate regulations and regulatory capacities, transparency, accountability, and responding to citizens' needs. That's why, for instance, we have the perception of Nigeria, the People's Voices Survey, to understand those kinds of issues that you are raising. And they are really issues. Nigeria's journey to expand uh, health insurance is being one that has been more than 20 years uh, old. And um, the risk pool that we have had is very limited. Uh, a large number of us, in fact, provide more than two-thirds of health spending in Nigeria is private. And much of it is out of pocket. And that means that those who have pocket like you and others can be able to afford. But there are many Nigerians who are unable to afford because they don't have the pocket. They're just poor. So that's why we said reforming the NHIA as a regulator is such an important piece of the agenda. And steadily, that reform is underway with a new leadership of the Health Insurance Authority, right, backing, um, build, backed by the Act that has made health insurance mandatory and for all Nigerians and to expand the enrollment so that the risk pool is larger. It's like any insurance. If you have a small risk pool, the premiums are higher. Looking at the actuarial analysis that is based on real data, the last time Nigeria had actuarial analysis for the, country, for the premium that people are paying was more than 10 years ago. So when you look at that, the premium you are paying, how much can it afford? revising the tariffs that the um, providers actually are compensated with. Um, that has been increased recently. And then uh, giving people choice so that the HMOs are not taking people for granted, that you build some of that choice as well, enabling the regulator to use technology to monitor who is getting what, and then expanding the vulnerable groups fund because there uh, are folks uh, like you and I who can afford um, to have an insurance. But there are many in the informal sector, some who don't have really the resources to pay the premiums to be insured. So expand the Vulnerable Goods Fund so that we channel through the state health insurance uh, uh, authorities um, uh, the resources, the payments that they can be able to uh, get protected if they have to uh, get, get health care. And we've added 2.4 million Nigerians in the last uh, 10 months, basically, through the Vulnerable Goods Fund, in collaboration between the states and the federal government, largely the public health insurance. The private health insurance has not had as much, and we've seen that now in the perception survey. So there's a lot more work to be done, but this is just a year in a 25-year journey to expand health insurance for all Nigerians. So in fact, uh, this is an area that we will continue to focus on and to expand the health insurance to provide risk protection for Nigerians. And that will also have spin-off in terms of the public and private sector providers who have to adapt to the increasing volume that will result from it, rising health insurance. Okay, all right. Honorable uh, Minister, I wonder what is going on at the moment because we heard uh, that the Joint Health Sector Unions and Assembly of Healthcare Professionals Johesu has uh, suspended the strike, uh, giving you a six-week ultimatum to address all the demands that they placed on your ministry. What's the update on that? Yes, the long-standing issues uh, that we inherited, and we have built a very constructive relationship with not only the Johesu but all the other health professionals in the sector. Um, are committed to putting the, the interest of Nigerian citizens at the center rather than our own uh, narrow uh, professional interests. And that has brought back a bit of coherence, a bit of um, mutual respect, I think. And we've seen a lot of stability over the last year and a half. 
and the Johesu issues, for instance, the uh, Conhez adjustment, this is long standing. It's more than 10 years old. But I do believe that we have a path forward which is satisfactory to them. There are allowances, areas that have uh, been long standing as well, and we're working towards resolving those. There are other uh, policy related uh, issues that they have raised, and we discuss with them. Uh, for instance, the protection of Nigerians, I mean, the risk protection. Uh, how do we ensure that the health sector, the health of Nigerians is protected better? Is our regulatory system adequate? Or how do we ensure that we strengthen it without undermining existing regulatory mechanism, whether it's the PCN, uh, the NAVDAG, or other health professional bodies? But how do we strengthen so that uh, the risks that Nigerians are facing uh, at the subnational level, for instance, uh, providers who are unlicensed, who uh, oftentimes uh, practice, but who regulates them? Uh, federal government regulates the professionals, but the physical facilities are regulated by the subnationals, and they vary in their ability to do that. And that's not an easy uh, problem to fix, but we are committed collectively between the federal government states and other professional groups to do it in an inclusive manner because the health of Nigerian is what is bringing all of us together, not uh, one group or the other. So we're all in it together. I will say we have a very healthy uh, dialogue, and it's natural to sometimes agree, sometimes disagree, and agree to disagree. But we are committed to ensure that we work together in a respectful manner and address long-standing challenges together with them. And I'm glad that they called off the strikes. Thank you very much indeed, Honorable Minister. Your explanations are indeed uh, convincing. You know, when I ask myself down the line, can we guarantee that those who walk down the line are able to follow through with these types of ideas that you have talked about, plans that you have talked about, accountability, proper supervision, and commitment to delivering uh, on all some of these things? That's my fear, Honorable Minister. Well, I think so long as we empower the citizen to take an interest and we measure and we tr track the, the performance i think it's more likely than not that this can be sustained that's why the measurement system we are putting in place the dhs for instance we're having one 2023 there will be another one there will be midterm uh, dhs will have annual joint review there will be perception service some of the times they may not be favorable. Now we are hearing this confidence, and of occasionally we may falter, but it's immaterial because we want to learn what are we doing that is working, what is it that is not. And for those who follow us, uh, they will have to struggle to underperform if, in fact, Nigerians are enjoying uh, better things. And if we also underperform, we will know it's a wake up call, and then we can do better. That's the idea so that we collectively co-create a system that will serve us and serve us well. All right, we have to go now. But Honorable Minister for Health and Social Welfare, uh, Professor Ali Fateh, what legacy would you love to leave behind after serving the country? Well, I think the President articulated a renewed hope uh, vision for this country, that is people-oriented, that is prosperous, and health and well-being of Nigeria is at the center of it. I'm so glad to be as part of his team, and I hope that his vision gets realized, and I'll be very comfortable uh, to be remembered as someone who contributed in a small way to achieving that vision for this country. 